Memphis Mining makes Bitcoin mining accessible to everyone. Start mining in as little as 48 hours with our turnkey hardware, online and mining directly to your Bitcoin wallet within two business days. Find out more at compassmining.io and get started now. Hey miners, welcome or welcome back to the channel McNally Money, the new home of power mining analysis. In today's episode, Anthony Power and I have a real doozy for you. We've brought along five key valuation metrics to help you better evaluate, compare, contrast the Bitcoin mining stocks that you invest in. We've got a lot of data, tables, and charts to get through in today's video, but before we do, please take a second, smash the like button, you guys. It's free to do. It helps me out in a big way. Anthony loves it. If you're not already subscribed, McNally Money, feel free to join. And let us know in the comments section below how you're feeling about the Bitcoin mining sector overall. If you use any of these metrics yourself when you're doing your own due diligence and your price target for Bitcoin in the final few months of 2024. Now, with that being said, let's get into today's episode. Okay guys, so that's right. Today's episode action packed for you. Anthony's brought along some of his famous tables and charts. We're going to be talking valuation metrics, five key metrics specifically, Anthony, that you use uh, to better understand these companies and really compare and contrast the valuation of each, which is getting, I would say, more difficult by the day as these companies continue to evolve and grow. Uh, now, this is really stemming from an article you put out for Compass this week. Um, so you can talk to that in a second here. But this is one of the reasons we're so excited about this partnership with Compass on the channel. Uh, you've been publishing for them for quite some time now, Anthony, I think over 80 articles. And this is the most recent example of really this uh, synergistic partnership, hey? Absolutely. Um, started back in April 2022, and I signed up originally because I wasn't sure about, you know, if I could write articles. Um, I'm, I'm an accountant by qualification, and um, I, I'm more happier producing numbers, and that's why people probably know me more from my tables, which I've been putting on X, formerly Twitter, for the last three or four years. Um, but I started to write articles back in April 22, and I signed up for three um, because, it, you know, there's no way I was thinking it was a long-term thing. I thought it was just like, a, you know, just a, a guest writer. And at the moment, I think we're heading probably close to about 85 articles in the last um, two and a half years. So, um, and the great thing great thing is 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 um they haven't actually given given me a title to write about so all 85 articles and my own articles i i do a monthly article on all the miners which i think i'm probably the only person in the space that does that so i do cover all the uh, the monthly operational metrics and i think that's what got people interested you know 3 or 4 years ago i was doing this when I started just with like six of the miners, six or seven of the miners, the miners from 2021. And it's just grown. And at the moment, we're covering 15, 16 miners now. So we're getting probably mo more than half of all the total listed miners in North America, and certainly all the all the the big and well known miners. So yeah, it's been a it's been a um an interesting journey uh, with Compass, great working relationship with them. Um you know, and and they're always you know really keen to promote the articles they publish them so that gives me an, an access to get the articles out there so more people can read them and sure. um, they go on various social media platforms so they go on linkedin they go on x and then compass also release them through their social media and also including things like the newsletter um again all our articles are, are on the uh the power mining analysis website so people can always go back and look through there and and you can also go via the compass mining website they've got their own website and they have a compass content part of the website so you can go through there and have a look at not just my articles but there are other writers for compass um and other various bits and pieces they do podcasts and uh you know a lot more than just 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 me at the moment yeah, it really is an excellent source of content and education, which is exactly what we're about as well, Anthony. Uh, interestingly enough, any kids listening out there, you got to follow your dreams. This is an, uh, an accountant who failed English class that is now a published uh, writer and author in some of these top publications. So Anthony, uh, congratulations. A lot of times very difficult to make the transition from numbers 
to uh to written and i know that firsthand so great that we can get that uh information out to the public and even more great that we can talk about it on our own podcast today so the article went out uh, I believe yesterday or the day before, Anthony, talking about five uh, valuation metrics to use for the Bitcoin mining companies. Now, you've looked at 16 miners in this table. So the way to read through this, you guys, is you've got a robust balance sheet extract, really any number that you would want to know about these miners listed in this table. So we can walk through that first. I'll put it up on the screen. Feel free to pause at any point here, you guys. And then we'll talk about these five metrics that you can use to better understand the numbers on this table. So, Anthony, with that being said, uh, I'll throw up the balance sheet extract. And why don't you walk us through what we're looking at here? Yeah, so, we, you know, the, the, some of the key things to look at is you want to make sure that the in the current climate, and we've talked about this, the Bitcoin price you know, has, has come down from its highs in March and, and again in when it got to over 70,000 in June, um, you know, now hovering 57, 58,000 as we speak today. Um, the fact we've had a halving in April means that the, uh, the hash price, i.e. the revenues that these mining companies are able to achieve on a day-to-day -day basis has been cut really short. I mean, pre-halving, uh, most of these miners were achieving something like $110 per petahash per day. So for every amount of petahash on the global network, they're probably getting about $110. We've seen that dwindle now down to about $40 uh, per petahash per day. So that's a significant drop. Um, and so margins are being squeezed. And therefore, you want to make sure that, um, you know, key to that is how how these um, current miners can operate in the current in the current climate i.e can they meet their immediate requirements so by highlighting uh, a company's current assets and its current liabilities you're letting people know um, can they meet all their obligations over a period of say the next 12 months and so those are very important uh, metrics to look at there and from that, you determine like what we call the current ratio. And we'll go on to that in a second. You also want to know from a valuation perspective, if I'm investing a dollar in one of these mining companies, how much am I getting in terms of value from their assets that they hold on the balance sheet? So we can look at like the net assets of a company. And that's looking at all the, you know, the 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 the, the money they hold, all the mining machines, the facilities, anything that has a value. And then take away from that anything that is a liability. So the net assets of a company is effectively what what you're getting. So if you're investing one dollar in a company, you know uh, what will you what will you get in terms of assets? And ideally, if you're investing a dollar in a company, you want to try and make sure you're getting sort of like a dollar in return, unless there's a premium for that. And then you need to understand why you're paying a premium for your share. So if you're buying a share at, say, $1, but the actual net asset value um, um, per share is is like, you know, 50 cents, it means that for every dollar you're investing, you're getting 50 cents of assets. So you're, you're paying a 50 cent premium. You need to understand why you're paying that premium. So that's another sort of like a line in the balance sheet that you should be uh, looking at there. Um, obviously, the, the value of a company... Market capitalization is the, is is a, is the well known um, you know metric for that, but there's an actual better metric to use when you're valuing a lot of companies in the same industry, and that's the enterprise value, and the enterprise value does start with the market capitalization. It starts very much so with that, and then it looks at the sort of the cash um, and cash equivalents. And for this exercise, I look at cash, cash equivalents, and I look at the Bitcoin hodl as well. And those get deducted from the market capitalization. But then you've also got to look at any debt on the on the balance sheet. And that will be um any 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 debt through sort of like loans or notes, plus any leases that these companies have. And so from that position there, you can calculate sort of like the total debt. And then you can do a sort of a calculation based on what the debt um as opposed to the assets are of the company so if the company's got a you know a million dollars of assets and say a hundred thousand dollars of debt 
you can get a ratio to determine the debt to to that equity uh, ratio there. So that will cover that in, in a certain extent. And then finally, the last two metrics, which are really important, especially for Bitcoin miners, is actually trying to value what their exahash um, is actually cost in terms of a, co a cost valuation, effectively. So if you look at the enterprise value of the company and then look at the current um, hash rate in terms of exahash, and divide that into that enterprise value, you then get sort of like a value for each exahash they have from about from the balance sheet. And so that's really important to do a compare and contrast, which, which mining companies have a high valuation, which have a low valuation. And again, I also do the same exercise, but instead of using the current hash rate, I've used a future hash rate and I've gone for the end of 2024 because I think that's a more realistic time frame. And we could start looking at 2025, 2026, but you know, let's keep it real and and let's look at what the uh, the hash rates are anticipated to be um, at the end of the year. Now, before we go into the metrics, I just want to I just want to just set um, aside some of the assumptions and the actual subsequent events um, that have occurred since those quarterly earnings were reduced. So, all the data or most of the data I've used in these metrics came from the recent quarterly earnings because that's when they issue the balance sheet. So, all the balance sheets for this exercise were done based on the recent quarter earnings, which ended on uh, June the 30th, 2024. So using that balance sheet there, I'm able to determine quite a lot of these metrics. Um, the market capitalization and the enterprise value, I've actually calculated the date that I wrote this article, which was as at September the 8th. So I've used up-to-date market capitalization, which makes sense rather than go back to June. But the, um, the balance sheet data in terms of cash, cash equivalents and debt, which are all three important parts of, of these metrics, that was taken from their balance sheets as at the 30th of June. Now, to determine um, the HODL values for Bitcoin and in, in terms of um, Bit Digital, they have an Ethereum HODL. I've used the valuation, values of those uh, HODLs based on their latest production uh, reports, which were as at the August the 31st. And in terms of price of Bitcoin and Ethereum, I've used September the 8th, which is the same day I was able to look at market capitalization. So wherever you've got a really current number that's in the um is is open and transparent, I've used it. Now I know that some mining companies will say, um, you know, we increased our cash in July and in August, but I've I've not took account of that because until I see it in writing to say that that's part of the balance sheet. Um, and I'll give you a good example of that there. So in terms of TerraWolf, TerraWolf um, will have in this position here, when they released their recent earnings report, they had, I think, 70 to $80 million of debt on the balance sheet. Now, we know that in July they repaid that debt. There was a big um, uh, update come out, and, and shareholders would have, been, would have been pleased to see that update because that's a significant amount. Now, when you're paying eighty million dollars a day, if you look at the transaction that's involved in that, you are you are taking eighty million from your cash, so you are reducing the cash by eighty million, and you are also reducing the debt by eighty million. So there is a netting off effect. Now I've chosen not to show that in um, this position here. I've shown the debt as at the end of June, so I don't want people trying to shoot me. And there's reasons for that, because I don't know, um, you know, they may have raised uh, money through an ATM post uh, the 30th of June to pay for that, and so it's more clarity required before I start including those numbers. So I've tried to be as sense. transparent as possible, but I've yeah. given the assumptions and some of the subsequent events. And the same will apply to Course Scientific as well. And Course Scientific is um, is an interesting one because effectively they only came out of Chapter 11 on the 24th of January this year. And when they came out of Chapter 11, there were so many caveats around their balance sheets. They'd issued um, not one set of warrants, but two sets of warrants. So they issued a Course uh, W warrant and a Course uh, Z warrant. Now, um those warrants that were still in, in uh, still not um exercised at the end of june are shown on the balance sheet as effectively a liability so they have a value and they're shown as a liability so really um i would 
Um, I would not pay as much attention to the core scientific numbers in these metrics because they'll make them out to be probably worse than they really are. And we're hoping that the next set of quarterly numbers will provide a more accurate financial position of the company because, as I say, there's a, they've, they've actually done a lot of um, uh, reducing debt and um, increasing debt effectively since the last uh, earnings report in terms of they they repaid 260 million of notes, they took out 460 million of new notes at a low percentage and basically reduced all the old debt. So, it, you know, we, we can, you know, take take the you know take that into consideration when you're analyzing these numbers in this report here they are only accurate as at the information that's out there i would say that course position is far better in terms of all their updates than we're showing here now so i don't people running for the hills when we talk through some of the metrics and realize hang on anthony you've been saying for weeks about you know core scientific going to be the highest market capitalization and yet in here it's it's not looking as rosy but there are reasons for that and we'll probably talk a little bit more as we go through yeah i'm i'm sure we will it's nice that you list all your assumptions there and as you say uh, a debit and credit for every transaction as i've learned in the accounting world so with that being said anthony the first uh graph i guess that we wanted to look at is the current ratio so as you just mentioned this basically looks at a company's availability of their current assets to be pay current liabilities within the next 12 month period all of these companies are in a great position for the most part and you've talked on the channel previously anthony uh, in some situations you may actually want this ratio closer to one to actually utilize that cash uh, rather than having it on the sideline. Now, we understand for some of the miners, uh, Riot is a great example. With some of these power contracts, they need to have uh, a lot of cash or Bitcoin uh, in the bank, and that's part of the obligation. So hopefully you can talk through that in a little bit more detail, Anthony, but uh, current ratio is the first one up here. Yeah, so current ratio, as I articulated earlier, looks at all those... Um, you know, because it provides that insight into the short term, you know, financial health and liquidity of each of the companies. And uh, you take the current uh, assets of the company, you divide by the current liabilities, and that gives you a ratio of how easy it is for the company to meet its obligations. And so if we look at the, um, the table there, um, we can look at um, uh, Bit Digital. Now, Bit Digital, um, you know, have literally zero debt so you know there's a i think they've got a few small leases it's not it's not a, a, a big amount at all no significant um debt for borrowing if, if that makes more sense so in terms of their current assets um divided by their their current liabilities they've got 21 times more assets to cover their liabilities over the next 12 months. So, you know, it doesn't matter where the Bitcoin price ends up. Bit Digital is sitting are actually quite well at the moment. And then you've got a number of miners like CleanSpark, Iron and Cypher uh, and Riot and Hive all over, well over seven. And so seven times, you know, your your current liabilities is, again, it's a really strong position. And to be honest with you, you'd argue that sort of, 14 of the of the miners in that graph there are actually above one and we look at one as the fact that you know if you're above one it means that you can cover your immediate uh, liabilities without reliance on anything else so that's that's a good position Slooner is slightly uh, below that and griffin is um is significantly below that but again there are some sort of like you know there are caveats so as as much as like um um, you know, as much as they, it might appear that they might struggle to meet their short term obligations, you know, they may be, and we know that Griffin and Saluna both operate efficiently, um, both have, have tapped into really cheap energy. Um, and so, you know, if they're able to sort of like, you know, um, you know, they can turn over, you know, uh, you know, the inventory that in, in within the company and, you know, access. Um, other types of liquidity to keep them on track there. So, you know, I don't see it as being a major issue. One could argue, effectively, that actually Bit Digital is not utilising its assets as much as it should be, because if you've got that amount of assets more than your liabilities, 
And we know that at the end of August, they had uh, in the region of $216 million of um, cash and Bitcoin and Ethereum holdings, $216 million, and with zero debt, that's a significant war chest. Now, you know, some retail investors might say, well, what's the plan to utilize that there? It's great having it there. Are there some opportunities that, that come along where you can sort of like maybe um, look to maybe buy a facility so that you can deliver high-performance computing hosting in your own facility? So that may be a reason why Bit Digital have got a significant war chest just in case. Now, um, Anthony... So Quick question on that. Bit Digital has a lot of that Ethereum holding staked. Would that be considered uh being used or not being used, I guess, in this in this metric? Um, so so from a staking point of view, it would really depend on on um if it's so we look at short-term assets as those that can be liquidated within a 12-month period. So if the if the Ethereum can be removed from staking and liquidated within that 12-month period, it would count towards theirs but i mean these are taken from their um from their account gotcha. so the current liabilities and current assets are taken from the balance sheet so in in terms of what a current asset is it's an asset that can be liquidated within t within 12 within 12 months and um, and one other question for you anthony you talk about uh the ability of these companies to withstand a, a drawdown in the price of Bitcoin for industries like, uh, say, gold mining or oil and gas or Bitcoin mining that are very commodity price focused. Would you want to have a higher current ratio um, as more insulation in in case of an underlying deterioration in in the price of the asset? I think you know you. I mean, you'd want to you'd, you'd you'd maybe want to have it slightly higher than one, but you I I think to the extent that some of these are sort of like you know um, seven eight and in bit digital twenty one, um, that might be you know a stretch too far. But bear in mind what you're you're looking at some of these companies. So look at that top five there; they're all sort of like equally looking to grow in terms of either hash rates or in terms of high performance computing. So having that abundant amount of current assets available gives them the opportunity to move very quickly and if we look at um um you know recent updates from the likes of you know iron and clean spark where they've gone in there and they can make orders on miners they can buy sites um really really quickly cipher as well just just bought a 300 megawatt site for you know potentially for hpc hosting when you've got a, a a great balance sheet to do that, you can move really quickly. We talked about the challenge for some of the smaller miners, and if you look at the that current uh, um, uh, table there, the, the the sort of like the three at the bottom, uh, Sato, Saluna, and Griffin, are the three are three of the smallest miners in there. So, you know, we talked about that before. Even, without even looking at the sort of the balance sheet, the challenge is 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 how do these grow? So. You know, we we've looked at Clean Spot. They're continuing to grow hash rate. Iron, you know, just you know, just achieved sixteen x hash, going to thirty by the end of the year. Cipher having a massive um, increase next year. Riot, we know they've got a big increase there, so they're all operating. Hive want to be, you know, have a bigger HPC uh, business than the one they've got at the moment. So again, all moving in the right direction and, and this ratio sort of like here highlights or supports um that sort of methodology what they're doing there but um to be, as i say the great majority on that sheet there are you know effectively covered um and you could you could have an equal and opposite argument as to griffin and to be a bit digital as to why one is so low and one is so high and the nature of the industry at the moment so it's not it's not all doom and gloom i would be a I'll be slightly cautious of Griffin at only having effectively 0.13 assets to cover their liabilities um, over the next 12 months. And we have raised that with um, uh, Rob on, on, the, on, the, on the podcast. But things move very quickly in Bitcoin mining circles. And he's had so many, um, uh, looked at so many opportunities. And, um, you know, I think 20 to 25 um you know letters of interest so he's working through those there and we'll see what happens in the in the next quarter or so yeah very helpful appreciate you walking us through that one anthony now next up we have 
uh, enterprise value to net assets. So you've already walked us through how to calculate enterprise value as a function of market cap. This one, if you look at the table here, we've really got bookends, Riot on one side, Terra Wolf on the other, quite a disparity between the two. So walk us through this one, Anthony. What are you looking for in terms of this number or ratio? Yeah, so again, this is this is about how much I'm going to invest my dollars and what return I'm going to get in terms of net assets. So this one here quite clearly shows Riot. If you if you were to invest for every 28 cents you invest in Riot, you're effectively getting $1 of of net assets. So, um that's really that's a really important, um, really important thing to to understand. Um, you know, um, you know that 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 anything below one gives an indication that potentially the this company is is undervalued, and so um, it's worth you know it's worth looking. You know, uh, more than half the the miners in that list there are, are are under one undervalued there, and then we look at again we go and look at the ones towards the right hand side of the graph, and we've got Terra Wolf at three point six five. So if you're investing three point six five dollars in Terra Wolf, you're effectively getting one dollar of asset for that, and we've already discussed um, on many podcasts recently that their valuation may include a premium on the grounds that subsequently they could be announcing a you know a HPC deal that will um warrant that premium so you know it's 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 you know that's certainly um you know a, a good enough reason we've talked about the likes of Terrawolf and Cypher being possibly um either or being the next miner to announce something along a similar type of contract deal that the one that core scientific has in place there someone with, a, with either a, a big client or a hyperscaler uh, and bear in mind i think amazon are located near the uh, terra wall facility at lake mariner so so you know opportunities all around there but we just need that announcement so terrible share price in recent months certainly in 2024 as as has done better than literally every other mining company in terms of um you know it's it's been green throughout the year and it was i think last time i looked it was 80 percent up year to date and the majority of miners are down year to date so terra wolf has been the one that stood out core scientific again another one that's that's done there but you know we we've talked about core scientific so often we we, we should be wearing bloody core scientific t-shirts i think at this rate and hats and banners and stuff like that but they've got the contract that everyone else wants so we can't hide from that it's just a great position to be in um so i i i sort of like bear in mind when you look at terrell and you think oh it sound, looks overvalued at first glance it does but read into the number read into the fact that why that share price has had some activity listen to patrick um on the various podcasts that we've done and he's been on various spaces meeting patrick fleury is the cfo of terror wolf he's one of the most transparent um directors in the space and um he will you know he will you know he will he's answered all the questions he's been you know sometimes i'm like you know taken aback at how transparent he is and he made no bones that you know they're looking to you know to to increase hpc um uh, hosting next year um at the expense of not increasing their bitcoin mining hash rate whereas you know most miners are still trying to increase the hash rate while looking for hpc but they've literally said nope we're going to go to 13, just over 13 by the end of the year, which was our original target. But next year, the focus is on HPC. So that's um, that's where people sort of need to sort of have that balanced approach there, look at what's happening there, because core scientific have actually more liabilities than their assets. That's why they're not in this graph. Um, you know, they've got, you know, because they came out of chapter 11, um, it was a negative figure, so you can't have a negative figure in this particular uh, ratio here. It would be, um, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be appropriate. But we've explained why Core Scientific's got a negative figure, and actually, as every quarter happens in the future, now the only thing that will happen with Core Scientific is every quarter it will get better as more and more shareholders exercise those warrants, and that cash goes into the company, and they can use that cash to grow um to you know to do things you know maybe slightly quicker look at more opportunities um it's all positive on on that side for course scientific it will it will certainly improve 
um, you know, more capitalization. And and the market wants the revenue start coming in from that contract next year, you know, at the rate of over 400 million a year, then you'll start seeing some, um, you know, that should really impact the share price as well from where it is at the moment. Compass Mining is your trusted partner in Bitcoin mining. Whether you're investing in one machine or thousands, our customizable solutions are tailored to meet your needs. We are your experts in Bitcoin mining, offering a platform where individuals and businesses can purchase hardware, host machines, and access a range of ancillary Bitcoin mining services. We also specialize in large-scale site development and data center operations. Discover more at compassmining.io and see how we can power your success today. Yeah, most definitely. I appreciate the context on Core Scientific. That was going to be my question as well, is, is what happens if it's a negative ratio. Now, next up, third chart here, we've got uh, debt to equity ratio. Now, this is displayed as a percentage. Again, a big spread between the miners. Now, interesting to get your thoughts here, Anthony, because last cycle, we saw a lot of the publicly traded miners take on a lot of debt. That was ultimately what led to the demise of many of them, got core scientific into some trouble, Terra Wolf was in trouble. Uh, there was a lot of miners that were heavily loaded with debt entering uh, last cycle, or sorry, exiting last cycle. Now this cycle, we've seen the ATM used quite a bit uh, to fund growth and CapEx. So curious to get your thought on the debt to equity percentage. Uh, what's a healthy figure or range here and, and any context you can add? Yeah, you're quite right. 2022 highlighted a number of miners that either went into Chapter 11 or literally about to go into Chapter 11. So Core Scientific actually went into Chapter 11 and spent 13 months there re reassessing their position and negotiating with all their creditors. Then you had the likes of Argo Blockchain, who actually announced via a fax that they'd gone into Chapter 11 um, pre preempted it really, and then they 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 sort of like took it back within hours and said, "Oh, we're not going to chapter eleven. Someone someone pressed the button in advance there." Um, but if you look at that uh, table there, um, Iron defaulted on loans um, that they couldn't afford to repay back to to Nidig when the value of the um, mining machines was considerably less than the debt, so they defaulted and and asked Nidig to to recover those machines. Um, and look at their position now, you know, they're in sort of like, you know, first position, they have got zero, zero, zero debt, you know, I think it's, I think it's less than one, it's it's about just over 1 million in total amount. And that's, again, it's a small lease. So, um, you know, you, a lot of these miners will have buildings that they're, they're leased buildings. And so, you know, that is a form of debt um, on, on, on the sort of like on the balance sheet there. Another one that springs to mind, if you remember Bit Farms, so Bit Farms back in the sort of like uh, middle of 2022 had 160 million dollars of debt on the balance sheet. They're now only showing four percent of total um, debt to to um, equity. Uh, Terra Wolf had a hundred and well over 100, about 130 million at one point. They're now looking in a in a in a better position, and actually that position there in. in actually includes the debt that's on the balance sheet as at the end of June. So um, their debt to equity ratio will be far better than that now. It would probably, uh, you know, in that sort of clean spot riot position there. So um, even at 22%, they're vastly improved since uh, since since June the 30th. They've got no um, managed debt on the, on the actual balance sheet. They'll probably have some small like leases and things like that, but it's, it's, it's small amounts. And then you've got the likes of uh, Hot. Now, bear in mind, um, you've got two, the, the merger of two companies there. So, you know, when Hut 8 merged with USBTC, um, Hut 8 itself didn't have a lot of debt, but didn't have a lot of access to sites and power. Had a nice um, balance sheet in terms of Bitcoin HODL, over 9,000. And USBTC had the opposite. They had lots of access to sites, lots of access to power based in the US, but they were really struggling with terms of cash flow and in terms of, um, you know, they had debt on their balance sheet. So when there was a merger, the one company then has um, effectively, um, you know, takes on on the debt of, you know, of, of both entities. And so they have got quite a bit of debt on the balance sheet. I think it's over 300, over 300 million. So, you know, not a small amount. 
But again, fifty-five uh, percent. So you know, um, you know, it's manageable. Uh, Saluna at sixty, Sato Technology at ninety-nine percent. So Sato Technology's debt is effectively um, about the same as its um, as its as its as its uh, equity at the moment. So that's a sort of like um, you know a challenging position to be in. Um, and 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 again, it's a small miner. So you know, we look at the market capitalization of Sato. It's probably in that sort of 16, 17, 18 million range. Um, and the you know that's where the challenge. If you want to grow, and they've you know they've used uh, a loan to purchase mining machines, some S twenty ones to grow hash rate. You know they've not got many levers to do it. They have got a small amount of hodl. So you know um, they do have um, you know a, a hodl in place there. And they've got a, a cash at the moment. So they've got just under about 3 million at the end of August in terms of cash plus hodl. But again, you know, you're looking to grow. It's not a significant amount. So, you know, that from their point of view, um, you know, that's going to be the challenge. How do they do that? And we talked yesterday on the podcast about some of this, maybe merger and acquisition, maybe a way forward for some of these miners um, to do that. But, um, you know, most of the miners on there looking really, really good. I mean, anything, you know, certainly bit dear and below there is step to work. is really, really, um, you know, uh, a strong position. And what will happen is, we, you know, we've already seen it with uh, Core Scientific. That announcement of that contract has enabled them to go to the market and, and get 460 million effectively of loans or notes for 3% interest, you know, a lot of these miners, bit farmed, were paying 17, 18, 19% on some of their loans back in 2022. So 3%, that's great. That's a great, you know, you want that sort of debt. Uh, Marathon, 2.25% on the 300 million they've borrowed, and they've converted most of that into Bitcoin itself. So they're, they're sort of like trying to follow the micro strategy um, uh, textbook of of building your hodl and getting the premium valuation of the company that way. So, um, but as I say, majority of those companies um, in, 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 in a good position from a debt perspective. Yeah. Interesting. You bring up marathon. I noticed they just hit their 26,200 coins uh, or 26.2 miles is the equivalent of a marathon. And I know Michael Saylor was bugging Fred uh, Thiel about that down in Nashville. So appreciate you walking through that one, Anthony. Uh, very nice to see these companies able to refinance debt at those low interest rates. Two and a quarter percent is uh, is unheard of. That's, I guess, the best we've had even on the residential side, uh, as long as I can remember. Now, the next table here talks about enterprise value once again. So that's the core metric here, as opposed to market cap, this time comparing it to current hash rate. Now, interesting observation here, Anthony, on the low end of the spectrum, you have Hive and Riot. So we've talked about from an exahash perspective, these companies look to be value plays. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, you've got TerraWolf and Cores. So these are the big two HPC players, or at least in the case of TerraWolf, anticipated to be an HPC player. So uh, another metric that would be great to see in here would be enterprise value divided by megawatts to, to kind of compare and contrast some of the HPC activity. But in terms of hash rate, Anthony, what do you see here uh, from the different mining companies? Yeah, I mean, this is, you know, this is, again, it's looking at enterprise value. So you can compare every company because some of these companies have got big hodls. So enterprise value really looks at every company side by side. And when you look at the hash rate that they're currently operating in, it, we've talked about before, if you remember the uh, riot when they looked, uh, made their approach to buy bit farms, we, they talked about this floor of about 100 million per exahash. And so that was a valuation that the industry was using. Now, bear in mind, we've seen a, a lot of downturn in some of these stock prices. So the stock prices will affect the market capitalization, will also affect the enterprise value, because the enterprise value uses the market capitalization as part of the actual uh, formula. So uh, with the Bitcoin price dropping to sort of, you know, 55, 56,000 at the weekend, it's it sort of like you know you're now getting uh, valuation per exahash for Hive and Riot around about 30 31 million and Sato Technology 
um, DMG and Griffin, three of the smaller miners, uh, also um, are in that sort of group as well. But when you're a smaller miner, you're not getting a premium for your for your share price. Or these three certainly aren't getting a premium for their share price. So, uh, it, you know, it's a, more of a case of look at some of the bigger miners, uh, you know, like the Hives, like Riots. Um, look at Iron again, 51. Uh, Bit Farms, 56 million. Clean Spot, 66 million. Now, with Wolf and, and Core Scientific, I've already explained Core Scientific's um, enterprise value because it takes into account something like $800 million of, of liabilities for their warrants. It's not overall a, a great metric for them to use currently. That metric will significantly improve. And what you've got to bear in mind and, and uh, with, with Wolf and with Core Scientific they might have the highest valuations here, but if you think about potentially the size of their self-mining as a whole business, I mean, Core Scientific, you know, the last three and a half years have mined more Bitcoin than every miner on that sheet. And therefore, you know, it was a big miner, but now their biggest part of their um, uh, service is actually going to be delivering HPC hosting. We talked in a, in a previous podcast, you know, six point seven billion dollars over the next twelve thirteen years. That's going to outweigh their Bitcoin mining massively. So when this valuation is by Exahash, you're having a company that's valued on two different services, and you're only using hash rate as the sort of like common denominator. Megawatts would be, and and think in terms of now. Um, you know, is a, is probably a, a better way of, of highlighting it because there are miners out there that are, and if you look at HUT, they are uh, self-mining, they are hosting, they they have managed services. So they've got a total of like, I think, uh, 1.32 gigawatts of power under their remit. Um, use that as a as a as a you know as a megawatt. Divide that into the enterprise value and get and get a, a price per megawatt. Um, and so we, you know, we 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 can include that. We'll probably include that in a, in a future podcast, uh, you know, in the next week or so, just to sort of like show what that would look like in terms of these miners. But this gives you an indication from, you know, most of these are self mining, so it does give you a, a relatively good indication. I mean, Hive um, have a, uh, I'm going to say, um, twelve to fifteen million of annualized uh, revenues in terms of um, HPC. Now, if you look at what they provided in their recent um, update for Q2, um, the HPC revenues were something like about 10% of the actual mining revenue. So you could say that that hive figure there of 30.7 could be reduced if you just wanted to talk about the self-mining elements of the business. So strip out um, the valuation that will be applied to HPC. Right is all self-mining, so we know that figure's probably an accurate one to use. Sato's all self-mining. DMG, predominantly all self-mining at the moment. They do have the fingers and number of pies, but they're not delivering revenues at the moment from that. Griffin mining, all self-mining. Iron, same as Hive, have a small amount, about 1.2, so 15 million annualized revenue in terms of uh, HPC at the moment. But their mining, in terms of Bitcoin mining, is is probably two hundred and fifty million dollars of annualized revenue. So again, it's you know you could be five or ten percent of you know of, yeah, of that size relative. there. Bit farms yeah, all self mining, Clean Spark all self mining, Cipher all self mining at the moment, Marathon all self mining, Bit Digital, absolutely not all self mining. They've only got I'm going to say. Uh, you know, I would say self-mining from their position is probably about 40% of their business and the HPC is probably about probably 58% and they've got a little bit in staking. So, you know, you could look at that um, $75 um, uh, million dollars per exahash and say, actually, that probably needs to be halved at least because, you know, they're getting most of their revenues now, $4.3 million and growing in terms of their... Um, in terms of their HPC uh, clients, they have two clients now, and one of the the, the original clients is due to um, 
increase in the next few months once they've uh, identified which machines that or gpus they're going to use to grow that contract so um you know effectively you could argue that the self-mining is really a small part and so then again use the megawatts as a way of of analyzing this um yeah. bit dear very interesting they've got loads of businesses so they do uh, cloud hosting self-mining hosting um, Bitcoin uh, Bitcoin miners. They now produce their own machines. They do HPC. So from a self-mining perspective for BitDeer, again, we, we looked at their accounts. I think it's about 40% was the self-mining revenue as, a, as part of the total revenue. So again, you could bring that down uh, and that would take you know BitDeer's hash rate probably close to where Hive and Riot are in terms of uh, valuation there. Saluna, um, Saluna's is quite high um, because they have, not in terms of debt, but they have some preference shares and some minority interests. And so you have to include, when you're calculating enterprise value, you have to include uh, not just debt, but a couple of other uh, items as well. So that makes their enterprise value quite high for a, for a small miner. But actually, um, again, um, if you were to sort of like look at what they do, their self-mining is actually really, really um, small uh, 0.8 exahash is self mining. They've got like 1.6 exahash of um, of hosted mining. They've got a HPC contract. They've got Dorothy two um, signing up now. They've got Project Catty um, imminently about to probably announce something in that area. There, they've got a couple of other projects that are on the go. So again, with Saluna, that's probably not giving you a, a, a great understanding of um, of self mining part of the business. It's it's a small reflection. So therefore, if you were to look at the self mining aspects, that number would come down considerably. Um, Huts at the moment have uh, pre predominantly hosted and management services, so their self mining is really really small in terms of in terms of um, percentage of their megawatts. I'm going to say less than ten percent of their uh, megawatts available is used for self-mining so that gives you an indication that that metric for them is probably um you know maybe not the maybe not the most appropriate one uh wolf at the moment um is pretty much all self-mining they do have a project um of i think it's two or three um megawatts for hpc so not really significant amount of hpc revenues at the moment so it's probably reflective but again there's a premium in their price because we expect an announcement, you know, imminently from Wolf to say, hey, ho, we've, we've got a deal here to deliver a big HPC contract. And we've already articulated what causes. So, as I say, from a from a, a value from current hash rate, majority a, 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 a total self-mine, but there's, there's a f beware that where those companies that do more than self-mining do more research into understanding what how that would be applied. And we'll yeah. certainly get the megawatt table out very, very soon to show people what it looks like for megawatts. Because um, in my annual reports, I do include megawatts in there. So it's not going to be difficult to calculate um, from this here. Great. That was actually my point that I forgot at the start there, Anthony, was it would be nice to see a comparison in terms of megawatts. Uh, but we'll get that video out shortly and we can compare and contrast. The nice thing about looking at Exahash is if and when Bitcoin price starts to really rally, this table will obviously be very relevant as, as the conversation starts to shift. Now, the next table, the final one here, very similar. This is enterprise value to future hash rate. Now, you used end of 2024 targets, which I think is appropriate. Obviously, these numbers are changing quickly, as we just saw with CleanSpark this week. Uh, so we can hardly predict where we're going to be at the end of the quarter, let alone the year or next year. So end of 2024, the table itself in terms of distribution looks very similar. So still have Saddle Riot Hive at the low end, or I guess the value end of this uh, spectrum. And then you've got the Wolf and the Core Scientific for the reasons you just mentioned on the on the higher end there, Anthony. So walk us through how this table changes or shifts looking a couple months out. Yeah. So there's a caveat with Sato. I mean, they're at sort of they're operating, they've got I think 0.56x hash installed at the moment. They're operating in August at 0.44. So they're, they're about 20% down on what they should be achieving and they recently had a fire in june so that will give a little bit of an understanding as to where that is there but they they've got a, a sort of like a near-term growth target of 1.8 x hash now that would be 
effectively three times where they are at the moment. And given the time frame at the end of the year, that's probably unlikely for them to achieve that. But it was the only target um, I had from a near-term target from Sato. We had remained on the on the podcast literally two weeks ago. So, you know, they went through their presentation. We did question them on, on, on how and when they would try to um, to get that target and you know he didn't have an answer for us in terms of a, terms of a time frame but they're looking at lots of different um uh, ways to sort of like to grow some revenue uh, capital and, and and help deliver that they are buying s21 machines as we speak to um install and 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 replace the ones that were damaged in the actual fire but yeah, as I say, I, I don't think they're going to achieve that. I don't know how much growth I would expect to see from SATA between now and the end of the year, but it would not be three times where they currently are. Absolutely not. So um, taking Sato out of the equation, you then have the likes of Riot now being effectively the most undervalued miner. Um, and actually, as a pure Bitcoin miner, that is reflective of their self-mining position there. So, you know, only $20 million per exahash. And um, it, which is which is you know in 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 terms of uh, valuation that's really good. If you think about uh, let's just look at exahash from a, from buying mining machines. So if you were to go and buy, um, you know the uh, the mining machines to get to deliver one exahash, um, you're going to have to pay at the moment for the S twenty ones, um, somewhere quite close to twenty million dollars uh, for that. So. Um, we we saw in the early parts of this year that Iron and Clean Spark <clears throat> were, were getting between fourteen and sixteen dollars um, a terahash, and so in, in terms of exahash, that's fourteen to sixteen million. That was at the very very cheap end, and that was them using what they call coupons to reduce the price. Now, if you go and um, go to Bitmain now and say I want to buy one exahash, and you've got no coupons. You can be paying anything from probably twenty to twenty-three million dollars an exahash. That would be there. So actually, if you look at Riot there with their expectation of achieving their hash rate, which we've said many many times we expect them to to fully do by the end of the year, um, that gives them you know a value per exahash lower than the cost of actually buying the machines now. So and bear in mind they've got these facilities that they own. They've got two massive sites, the two largest um, Bitcoin mining sites um, in the world at Rockdale and Corsicana. So you know the effects of the sites, uh, 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 you know, are, are free because you know to replace that mining um, hash rate would cost you more than the actual valuation there. So that's worth knowing. Um, Hive again. Anthony, just Sorry. to jump in there, very interesting that you bring that up. It would cost more to replace the machines than you, you can buy Riot for in terms of future exahash. I guess the concern there, though, Anthony, as, as we've highlighted many times, is uh, operating hash rate is, is a whole nother, another thing, right? Is having them plugged in and actually hashing. Right now, I feel like the market isn't confident that Riot is able or can do that, and they're discounting it. Yeah, absolutely right, and and you know we we've we've sort of like winced uh, many times when we've seen the right updates month after month, and we, you know, we're saying why they're not delivering as many as their peer miners, and yes, there's an element of the energy strategy and the credits and the, um, uh, the power cells that they use to 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 deliver that energy strategy. Um, but if you think about August, I think it was like six point four million dollars in terms of. Uh, power sales and demand response credits, um, but they were short, uh, you know, a significant amounts in terms of Bitcoin mine compared to their peers. So, you know, they had 23 uh, exahash plugged in, but they're only operating at about 14 and a half. That's, you know, it's nearly nine exahash uh, gone missing effectively. And yes, they got 6.4 million, which if you turn, if you convert 6.4 million to Bitcoin, it's about 110 Bitcoin um, based on the end of the month price. So, you know, that would have given them, you know, it's a little bit of leeway, but again, you still want probably another 110 uh, Bitcoin to get them where they needed to be if they'd ever had those machines plugged in uh, working 24 seven during that month instead of curtailing. But, uh, you know, again, you know, you'd expect with the future ash rate, these numbers have come down because we're looking at the same enterprise value now. Um, the enterprise value at the end of the year would, would obviously change between now and the end of the year. But if you're looking at now and, and people say, 
the some of the future hash rate is built into their market capitalization. So we noticed when Iron went out and said we're going from twenty to thirty, and we were like, you know, um, wow, that was a you know one of the biggest updates this year. The stock price went phenomenal. I mean, you know, it, it you know we were in um, uh, Dallas. Uh, in June, visiting um, Corsicana and uh, the the Denton facility, and I remember during that period, Iron share price went to about fifteen dollars fifty, and so you know the, the the market really saw that it wasn't about HPC. The market was looking at them from a hash rate perspective and giving them a real premium from a hash rate perspective. I mean, today the share price is like less than half that; it's around about the seven dollar fifty mark. So. Um, you know, that the, 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 there was, you know, that if you go back to that period in June, then maybe the iron would have been like, you know, into the 50, 60 dollars per per um, X, 60 million dollars per exahash. And so, with the with their price coming down, it means that the value per exahash has come down as well. Um, interestingly, Bit Farms there, 29.7 million. Well, right, we're offering significantly more than 29.7 million for Bit Farms in that deal. So um, I know, you know, the shareholders were, um, um, you know, not happy with the original offer. And, you know, I wasn't particularly happy with the original offer either. I'm a shareholder in Bit Farms, I'm a shareholder in Riot. Um, but it's a case of, you know, how do you value it? And one other point I'd like to mention is also with mining machines, um, you know, mining machines, you know, that we they get depreciated um, over a period, um, you know, because they have a life, maybe three, four, five years. So mining companies will depreciate them over a number of years. Some will use, I think some companies used to use two years and then some companies use five years. So they don't all use the same depreciation um, method from a period point of view. But if you think about mining machines now, so that so if Iron and CleanSpot were buying these S twenty ones at fourteen sixteen dollars per terahash, and the Bitcoin price rallies to say a hundred thousand dollars, the price of machines will go up, which will mean that some of these companies that have got these latest machines will also see valuation increase in the actual the actual miners that they hold on the balance sheet because that will come as like a, effectively and. Uh, an unrealized gain in the same and way that's that the Bitcoin... leverage you get that's that's the whole yeah. leveraged nature of so the this is a, another system. this is another thing to think about so we know at the moment bitcoin mining machines are probably you know depreciating down and there's no there's no values bear in mind in 2021 we saw people paying 80 dollars per terahash for s19s and there's two companies we've announced you know this year buying s21s which are more than twice two and a half times more efficient and can deliver a lot more bitcoin for you know a fifth of the price and that's um, significant in anthony because if you compare 14 or 16 dollars to 80 dollars you're talking a multiple five six times value of these fleets yeah. some of these companies have hundreds of millions of dollars invested in their fleet if the value of that fleet goes up 500 600 percent uh that i guess that's kind of an accounting phenomenon hey when you get reverse depreciation or whatever appreciation i guess that's called uh but yeah very interesting anthony and and something we really don't talk about a lot you talk about the price of bitcoin going up revenues going up the hodl going up but the actual equipment itself gets more valuable. Yeah, and and so you know um, that's something to bear in mind. Um, and actually, that's something to bear in mind if you were sort of like thinking of maybe setting up your own personal mining. Um, you know, doing doing it. You know, individual through a hosted company. Is you go out there and buy your machines, and you're hoping the Bitcoin price will increase, so it gives you a better margin because you've got to pay for the electricity, and you've got to pay like a like a management fee or a hosting fee to look after your machine. But if the Bitcoin price rallies to, you know, like we said, 100,000, and you're then getting that extra margin, what should also be happening is if you ever came to want to sell those machines, you'd probably get a better price for selling the machine. So you have a, your capital value that you've spent initially um, could increase. So if you were paying, say, you wouldn't get the, the prices that um, Clean Spark and Iron were achieving because you're not buying the same level of, um, you know, miners. But say, for instance, you're paying twenty five dollars a terahash for an S twenty one Pro, 
and the Bitcoin price rallied and that went to say forty dollars a terahash, then you know you you could make a significant gain in terms of capital gain on your actual investment there. So sure. it's not just a case of if you do this type of um, you know going to this mining business, it's not just the the margin you make on mining. The, there's a potential. Uh, margin that, or a capital gain you'll make on the actual machine because they'll have a value as well so it's it's food for thought for people you know if they yeah. were interested in doing that sort of thing and we're actually seeing the same thing on the hpc side really anthony with the demand for power and megawatts and facilities now reaching a premium as well so it works on both sides uh, very Absolutely. interesting analysis today. I, I learn a lot when we go through these tables. I feel like I'm starting to understand uh, the balance sheet, the extracts in more detail. So you're doing your job, Anthony. I'll give it back to you for any closing thoughts. But you guys, this stuff takes a lot of time to put together. Feel free to hit the like button. It's 100% free to do. Big help to the channel. If you're not already subscribed, McNally Money, feel free to join and let us know in the comment section below if you find these type of educational videos valuable, if you use these metrics for your own due diligence, and if you're currently holding any of the companies we talked about in today's video. Anthony, appreciate the time. I'll let you close out here. Yeah, no, it's um, it, it, it's an interesting exercise looking at these here. Um, we'll certainly get the megawatts um, uh, value um, in terms of um, you know, enterprise value to megawatts to see what that looks like. That'll probably give a very much more accurate position then, because what that will do then is that will tell you how um, companies are utilizing their power to drive value in the company. And you just articulated there about these companies having sites. So we know that um, many of these companies have got options to buy sites and have significant amounts of power in the future. Um, some of those option prices will, will be increasing as well. So if they decide, actually, you know what, we need to move in a different direction and we have an option on a site, a one gigawatt site, for instance, they might be able to sell that site or sell the option on that site um, to a provider to, to, to avoid the sort of like 18 months, two years of having to incur capital costs to build it to start delivering revenues. They might just decide to say, you know what, we paid you know, X million for it when we when we bought the option. And now it's worth five times that because a hyperscaler wants to come in and, and do it on their behalf there. And and so that, you know, that's an interesting dichotomy as to, as to you know, how that um, can drive value in some of these companies as well. So, you know, you've, you've got some miners now with significant um, power, on their, you know, in, in, in on, on the balance sheet, you know, the likes of BitDeer with over 2.5 gigawatts. I'm not saying 2.5 gigawatts of fields. They've got 2.5 gigawatts of of sites that they're actively developing. Um, so that needs to be taken into consideration. You've got Iron, who've got uh, 750 uh, megawatts at the Childress site because it's had an, had an increase of 150 there. They've got 1.4 gigawatts at um, a site that will need to be obviously built um, and they've got a future an option on another site of about one gigawatt so you know that's potentially you know they've got two sites there that they could you know determine a different route to get some much needed capital into the space if if, if it's got a if the valuation of these is going up as people are led to believe that gives them some great leverage to then sort of like deliver childress and their current sites to a really high level in terms of HPC, because think about HPC. Uh, I think Sam said uh, on the podcast recently, or 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 Aiden may have said. I'm trying to think. I think it was a maybe Aiden and Frank. We had Aiden and Frank on. If you're delivering 30 megawatts of HPC, that's the equivalent of delivering 300 megawatts of Bitcoin mining, and so that's the power usage there now you don't need 1.4 gigawatts of site to deliver hpc i mean you, you would be i mean 1.4 gigawatts you're deliver you know you'd be delivering you know enough enough ai and hpc to cover half the world or something you know so you know in terms of mining facilities if you if you if, if that if that ratio is accurate that means that you know if they converted 1.4 into hpc that's effectively like um, uh, you know, um, four, one point, uh, sorry, 14 gigawatts of Bitcoin mining 
and the biggest miner at Marathon are, are operating with 1.1 gigawatt at the moment. They've got 35 exahash. So 35 exahash, multiply that by, you know, it's like 350, 400 exahash. That's half the uh, global hash <laughs> rate at the moment on one site, effectively. That's, if that's the 10 to 1 of... ratio is accurate. Yeah. But that would be interesting too, Anthony. Once you get Absolutely. the megawatt comparison, we can start looking. So that'll be for another discussion, you guys. Uh, but lots to unravel here, as always. Appreciate the time today. Anthony, great episode, as always. And we'll see you in tomorrow's video.